the love of our fathers. The love of our fathers. And as we observe and we read in a moment, there are two fathers, aren't there? Two kinds. An earthly father and a heavenly father. If you would, let's read Hebrews chapter 12 and those first nine verses and we'll hold up on these scriptures from there. Hebrews 12 verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Amen. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Amen. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are protectors, then are you bastards and not sons. Wherefore, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reference. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Okay. Our text speaks of two distinct fathers. In uh, verse 9, it says, We've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we give them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So we got the earthly father, and we have our heavenly father. He is our heavenly father because we've trusted his son as our savior. Let's talk a moment, though, beginning about the earthly father. We all have an earthly father. I've had one. <coughs> I personally believe, and this is an opinion, that one of the ills, one of the worst ills of our nation is fatherless homes. <coughs> fatherless home. And I don't say this as a racist, but they did a survey of the black people recently and they said 73% of the children being born to the black folks are born to single mothers. 73%. 27% only has a mother and dad. There's something wrong with that picture. Uh, this week they were discussing it on the news about same-sex couples adopting children. And someone stepped up and said they didn't think it should be that way because every child was intended as God intended when he made the father and the mother. And for a child to be buried, uh, to be raised with a male and a female. 
And that was the conclusion that they came to this week, at least in this particular case. It is unfair to a child to not have a mom and dad. I tell you this much, people that grew up in my generation had very little materially, had very little. We had enough to sustain us, but most all of us had a mom and dad that loved us and tried to raise us the right way. Now we're talking about a generation gone by. Because we've come a long way, and I'm afraid the wrong way. But God knew what he was doing when he made male and female, didn't he? And established fatherhood and motherhood. But God has placed man, you and I, men, as a head of the house. It is a great responsibility which men have shrugged that responsibility in many cases. But I want to remind you, and this is biblical, a man must answer to God for his house. He's made us stewards over our family. Under the Old Testament laws, the father had to deliver a sacrifice for he and his family each year. He had to provide a sacrifice and it was left up to the father to see that it was done. Man was responsible for his family. There's a story in the Old Testament when Israel had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years in their journeying back from Egypt back to the land of Canaan, God told them it's time to go on over at Jordan and take back your land. And the first thing they had was they had to attack Jericho. And when they went into Jericho, Quickly, God gave them victory over Jericho. But under the command of God, they were not to take <coughs> what belonged to those people of Jericho for themselves. So they went into Jericho and God gave them victory. And then they turned around and go to a little city called Ai, Ai. And they went over there and God let them have a defeat. A lot of people got killed. God had taken his hand off of them. Why? And God told them why. Because there was a man in the group by the name of Achan. Achan had taken of the forbidden stuff and hid it in his tent. And God said, he gave the command to Israel to stone Achan and his family to death. His family paid for what he did. He also paid. A man is still responsible for his house. In the same time in, in the history of the Israel we were talking about when they went into Jericho and then I... At, the, at that same time, there was a man by the name of Joshua. 
And Joshua told the people just like it was. He said, choose you this day whom you'll serve. If you're going to serve the father, uh, serve the gods that were down in Egypt, are you going to serve the true and living God? But choose you, he said. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He didn't have to say, honey, is that right? Joshua made the decision. He said, we're going to serve the Lord. And folks, that still needs to be the decision of godly fathers. But God made him man, the father of the household, the provider for his house. Matter of fact, the Lord said, He that provideth not for his, even those of his household, has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You know what I said? I said, The Lord said, He that provideth not for his own house has denied the faith. And is worse than an infidel. That says a lot, doesn't it? Folky. Men, if you're going to bring them into the world, feed them. Take care of them. Because God gave them to you. Now, God made him to love his house. The Lord wants us to love our family. In doing so, he is to teach his children the right way in life. He is to correct his children out of love. He is to correct his children out of love. If you will, let's look back at verse 9 in the middle of the page. Furthermore, we had our fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? All right. Look down at your next verse, Proverbs 19, verse 18. Folk, I take this literal. Solomon said, Chasten thy son while there is hope. Let not thy soul spare for his crying. He go cry a little bit. We come here and we learn how to cry. We get away many, many times because we're going to cry, right? You don't have to teach a baby how to cry. They know how. Right. They've learned quickly that they can get attention that way. But when you got to spank this kid, you got to do it because you love him. But you are compelled to make that child behave as we. Uh, my grandmother used to say to me, she said, behave yourself. <laughs> she was deaf and lived with us all those years. But we are to correct our children and raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There's a man in the Bible that was a poor illustration of this. He was a prophet of God. His name was Eli. Not Elisha or not Elijah. But his name was Eli. And he took care of the worship of God in those days. But he had two sons who were rebels, wicked. 
Their name was Hophni and Phinehas. If you would, let's read about them in 1 Samuel chapter 22. Or chapter 2, excuse me. Verse 22. Now Eli was very old. Verse 22. And he heard all that his son did unto all Israel. And how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Literally, they, they had sex at the door of the tabernacle of where they were supposed to be worshiping God. Verse 23. And he, Eli, said unto his boys, unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all the people. Everybody's talking about it. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. And look on down. What the Lord said is going to happen to those boys. Verse 12. In that day I will perform unto Eli... All things which I have spake, spoken concerning his house. When I will begin, I will also make an end. I'm going to punish them. I'm not going to stop. Verse 13. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. Because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. He turned them loose. Folk, you can't turn your kids loose. I'm really addressing all of us men and what God expects of us as fathers and what we're going to have to answer for one of these days. We are responsible for our house. You may shrug that responsibility, but it doesn't remove that responsibility. You're still responsible. Let's talk a moment, though, about our Heavenly Father. He's the one that's most important by far. Our Heavenly Father is the head of all. It all began with Him, didn't it? In the beginning, God. And folk, we don't know where in eternity the beginning was, do we? We had no control over that. Any of y'all have a control over yourself getting here? Brother Enrique pointed out in Sunday school this morning, uh, most of us don't know we exist till we're about three that we remember back. <clears throat> but God is the head of all. Through his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, he is our father. If you look back up to verse two at the top of your page, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. John said, Beloved, now, now, current. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Amen. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But one thing we know, when we shall see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. We're going to be like him. I don't know if you've thought about it or not. If he was the only begotten and the son of God and we put our trust in Christ and we become the sons of God, that makes him our brother, doesn't it? To the same inheritance that he has. 
Our Father is rich, our Heavenly Father. He supplies all of our needs. You and I have been born into the royal family. If you will look at the bottom of your page, Galatians 4, verse 6 to verse 7. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit, and that word is capitalized, meaning the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Boy, I like this. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. When we call him our Heavenly Father, we're calling him, we're addressing him rightly. That's where the Lord taught us to pray, wasn't it? To call him our Heavenly Father. Him being our Father, He is responsible for His house, for you and I. <coughs> and He has to chastise us sometimes. He does that because he loves us. Let's read again. Verse 6, if you will, toward the middle of your page. Verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? And then finally verse 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all the partakers, then you're not mine, you're bastard and not son. That was a curse word when I was growing up. But it's still a curse word literally. If a person is a bastard or not, uh, I was shocked one day. I have a neighbor where I live now. I've been there, he'd probably been there 20 something years. We've been there 42 years. And I was trying to witness to him a while back. I was over talking with him and I, I said, uh, call his first name and y'all live next door beside him there, right beside him for a while. But I said, What's your last name? I'll never forget his reply. He said, I'm a bastard. Don't know who my dad was. That was his statement. I don't know who my dad was. Well, that case probably, in many people's lives. But the Lord knows his, doesn't he? And I can tell you this much, a way to, to check your salvation out if you haven't been chastised, you better check up. You may like having truly been saved because the Lord's not going to allow us, his children, to continue to prosper if we ignore it. And that's why I wonder about a lot of people, some of those that have professed Christ over the years that you don't see them anymore in church. And if they're going along and nothing's happening to them, you wonder if they were truly ever saved or not. If they were saved, they're still saved. But you wonder what's going on. But when the Lord chastens us, He doesn't make mistakes. My sister's on with the Lord now. I got a picture of her yesterday. Her daughter sent me. We were my brother's sister and myself, a little bit of fellows together. But uh, uh, my sister would, I do something bad, she'd run and tell my mama, and my daddy, and they'd pull out that old leather strap. My sister would go for him. I didn't mean for y'all to whip him now. 
she get a whipping too? <laughs> but that's the way big sisters are, I've learned over the years. They're protective of little brother. And they're tattletales. <laughs> You know, my mama, I could run from my daddy in it. When he cooled off, he'd forget about whipping me, but not my mama. My mama would say, the harder you run, the harder the whipping's going to be. And that little lady, she had to bluff on me. <laughs> she wasn't bluffing, she meant it. What a great blessing to be a child of the king. We sell ourselves shortly. Folk, it's good news to be a child of the king. It's good to be a child of the king now because he favors his children. But it's going to be better in the ages to come. I heard a statement this week I've never heard before. You're probably going to hear it again because I like it and I'm going to be repetitious with this. If you think about it a moment, <coughs> what we did yesterday, even this morning earlier, is history. You can't alter it. You can't change it. It's said and done, it's past tense. Somebody said this week, not even God can change what you did yesterday because it's permanently recorded as history. Now, God can forgive you for yesterday but we can't change the facts, can we? It's recorded. That, not that God would want to change it, but I never thought about it that way. What's said and done, past tense, you're not going to change. What you did yesterday, right, wrong, or good, bad, or ugly, is irreversible. But thank the Lord, not unforgivable. You can change what you do today. Folk, our actions are eternal actions. You'll never be able to erase or change what you do now. So what I'm saying, we need to live that way. What we do is permanent. You ever thought about it that way? There's no change. Well, thank the Lord. Even when we're wrong, He loves us. He forgives us. The Lord said, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not just part, but He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Hope there's no greater love than that of our Father, even our Heavenly Father. I thank the Lord for our earthly Father's love. But moreover, I thank the Lord for that Heavenly Father that loves us, puts up with us anyway. 